Okay, everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining from. Uh, this is Alliance for Science Live. I'm Chris Knight, your host, uh, coming from Cornell University Department of Global Development in New York. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about digital agriculture, and we're joined by uh, Dr. Susan McCooch, who is a influential rice geneticist and also director of the Cornell Institute for Digital Agriculture, which is a new initiative. And so we're going to be learning about how uh, computing and AI and the cloud are uh, going to affect agriculture and how we can use those technologies to help farmers. So I'm very uh, thankful to have Susan here with us. Thank you for joining Susan. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, um, it's great to have you here. Um, so uh, first, let's I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the Cornell Institute for Digital Agriculture. Uh, how did the idea for the Institute for Digital Agriculture come about? Um, and uh, how did it get started? Well, I'll just back up a little bit in, uh, I, I would say in the history of cows, there's always been an interest in moving technology and agriculture forward. So the earliest um, incarnations, if you will, were in the area of what we call now precision ag and really initiated by people like Harold Van Ness and Josh um, Woodard and others in cows. But the real uh, inception of CETA as a faculty-driven initiative, which was cross-college and much more pervasive at the level of the university as a whole, started in about 2017, maybe, when um, Catherine Bohr, who at that time was Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, invited um, the Dean of the College of uh, Computer and Information Sciences on a field trip to visit some local dairies. And um, that was catalytic. It turned out that Catherine invited um, a, a kind of collection of people from across campus who were interested and it really ignited interest in the concepts of how internet technology and um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and some of the other things that were really hot in computer and information science might be applied in the area of agriculture. And there were already things happening obviously in precision ag that made that um, quite provocative. So it was uh, literally that, that field trip that then gave rise to a collaboration between what we call the College of Computer and Information Science or CIS and CALS and then engineering was brought in and eventually the vet college joined and all of those deans put some money forward to enable a faculty driven initiative to have regular conversations and start meeting um, to talk about how they might collectively move agriculture forward and attract new blood into the field. Um, so that yeah. was really the important beginnings. And I joined one of the luncheon sessions that they hosted for faculty um, in late 2017 and became interested. I thought it was a very, you know, it was a very proactive group and there were lots of new ideas floating around. That's how I joined. That's interesting. So in those first kind of conversations of bringing agricultural scientists and veterinary scientists and computer scientists and engineers together, what were some of those first conversations like? And uh, what were some of the the kind of the the points where where people had to learn or or bend uh, to kind of understand each other and move forward? Well, the vocabulary people use is different. And I would say the framework, the conceptual frameworks that people use when they approach problems are quite different, depending on whether they're coming from biology or engineering or computer science. The, the kinds of things that um, the computer science scientists think about is the generation of information, the capture of digital forms of information and the transmission of that information. Um, to either analytical programs or directly to people who need it. And they think about information in a very abstract way. They talk about the software defined farm. They talk about things that are models for other things. 
the engineers tend to think in um, a lot of very technical ways about how you then build the sensor that's going to capture the data or measure the quantity, be it soil moisture or be it um, something that goes around in a satellite and measures um, the hyperspectral um, mag, uh, you know, um, sorry, I'm losing my, my, my voice here. The, uh, the, the, the sense of what a plant is doing when, it, when it's fixing um, carbon. So the photosynthetic spectral imaging that you can capture. These are the things is the engineers think about how to build the gadgets that measure the quantities that will then be converted into digital data and transmitted. And the biologists think about the complex living systems that are the basis for life on earth. And they're really the focus of a lot of what, uh, obviously what agriculture is, but agriculture is the nexus between the physical environment, uh, the living environment and the human um, creative spirit. And I think bringing those three together is really the essence of where, where we need to be when we think about an agricultural system that could actually produce healthy food, uh, distribute that food Create, help create livelihoods and empower people across the globe to live healthier and more productive lives. Um, so crystal ball type question, you're the director of this, this institute at this time. So what's, what's your kind of transformative or radical vision for digital agriculture um, in, and in not just in the US context, but in, in a broader context to some of the uh, other places where we work uh, at Cornell. So I think the transformational potential is very much the vision that many of us bring, which would be a world in which we use natural resources more wisely, we created much more sustainable production systems, we had distribution that allowed fresher, healthier, um, more nutritious food to reach people and to get to the people who need it. And that we would be able to restructure the way we think about um, both production distribution and consumption so that we are embracing the concepts of what we call one health, meaning health of the environment, uh, health of animals, health of plants, health of humans, health of the microbial populations in the soil, but collectively health of the environment as we seek to um, grow and prosper, but at the same time to regenerate the, the productive forces that we need to continue life on the planet. Um, so my understanding is that there are uh, a few different people and, and different labs involved uh, with the Cornell Institute for Digital Agriculture, uh, working on a number of different projects. I'm wondering if you have uh, some examples that you'd like to share of some of the different things that are brewing, that are going on. Um, I know that there are some interesting, uh, for example, sensors that are going into orchards. Um, there's a lot of work with drones and autonomous vehicles and uh, also artificial intelligence uh, being used to analyze the data that's coming out of these uh, remote sensing applications. So um, how is it actually being applied at, uh, and what are like, some of the technologies that are coming out of this that are really exciting you uh, as a biologist? There are many, many different examples of um, applications of technology. I just wanna start by providing a little bit of a framework because each one of them is designed at some level to um, provide a deeper understanding of a complex biological system in an environment. So it's the, it's the living environment and the, and the physical environment interacting and giving humans both an understanding of how that functions and of how to manage it to, uh, to best advantage. So understanding is one goal. The ability to diagnose problems or perturbations in the system and be able to predict outcomes based on that diagnosis is another component of digital lag is the ability to predict outcomes so that we can then target interventions to, to create either more stable or, um, or if you will, more disruptive systems, depending on where you want to go, but to increase, for instance, soil health, be increased plant health, uh, animal health, and of course, human health. Um, 
And also the digital tools are going to, I think, empower us to make comparisons. So we need to be able to know whether a particular intervention, when we look at a before and after, we want to be able to measure and see whether we've had the impact we expected or whether we need to modify the way that we've um, um, we've, we've incorporated our, our um, interventions. And so measuring impact through some sort of comparison is very important as well. So once we keep that in mind, that the aim is to understand and diagnose, to predict and target intervention or make decisions, and then to be able to compare and measure impact. Those are the kind of overviews that these different examples will each one be trying to exemplify. So some of the kinds of research that we are funding, I will just say that since 2017, when we first posted our, what we call our research innovation awards from CEDA, we have uh, supported about um, 16 maybe grants, um, totaling $3.5 million. And the nature of these uh, proposals or seed grants is that a faculty member um, from one college needs to find a counterpart or a colleague in another college. And only when there are at least two or three colleges can they, um, can they uh, put forward an application for this kind of funding. So this funding is designed to create um, new, new uh, collaborations across Cornell. It's also across disciplines and to create new understanding and new insights. So some of the kinds of things that we supported Yes, they do involve, if you want to um, go down the road of talking about the vineyard one, there's one in uh, currently um, to promote remote sensing in uh, northeast, northeastern viticulture. So here in, um, in New York and in the northeast, where uh, we want to really empower local farmers to get an early diagnos diagnosis of disease so that they can better target and more accurately target um, the management of that disease before it becomes an epidemic. And those interventions or the digital component of that is um, a, co a combination of, of high resolution satellite imagery, hyperspectral solar induced fluorescence, which is called SIF, and something called synthetic aperture radar, SAR sensing. The data coming from those kinds of sensors then gets integrated into algorithms that help predict um, whether or not um, we have disease in a crop and they use um, so all kinds of, of image sensing and, and, and interpretation to understand and, and find the sources of disease before they become widely spread throughout the vineyard. And through that, the farmer can then go in and uh, manage that disease early. And that usually means that they don't have to use as much um, either chemical or manual labor to try to manage those diseases. Another example, which I think is really interesting here is uh, an application of um, the, well, the problem is now in cassava. So cassava is not a crop we grow much in upstate New York, but just to to, to branch out into an international um, application here of digital technology. The, the problem is that the amount of dry matter in cassava, which is the bulk yield that people are trying to harvest, relates inversely the amount of water content of the cassava plant, right? So what often happens is you have to go in and dig up the cassava, which grows as a root under the ground. And the the digital component of this is the, the development of a non-destructive surface nuclear magnetic resonance system that is non-invasive and it will measure the water and the dry content in cassava in various different settings, including in field um, across, the, across the growing cycle. And that enables a, a, a researcher at least, and in this case, it's the breeders who wanna do this, to be able to identify and measure the, uh, the, the growth and the dry matter content of different cassava uh, lines or uh, segregants in a breeding population and identify them without the kind of digging them all up and doing all that, that laborious estimation. These are technologies that will accelerate the breeding process in cassava. And uh, cassava is a really important crop, as you know, in much of uh, West Africa. And so that's the area in which um, 
those researchers are trying to apply this. Then there are um, soft robotics, you know, where you have a, a soft robot hand that are being developed to help with either um, harvest of strawberries, for instance, where you can pluck the strawberry when they're ripe and uh, it'll go through the field and, and, and only pluck the ones that are ripe. The, these soft robots are also being used to estimate yield in, um, in grapes. They go under the canopy and they weigh and they measure the, the clusters of grapes as they're forming. These soft, robot, uh, soft robots are, um, this is an area of engineering that is, it has many applications in, um, in human health as well. But those are the applications, some of the applications that we've been supporting in CETA. And then we have, you know, we have actually many of these, but I just want to give you one more example in uh, the dairy barn, because dairying is a very important, of course, here in upstate New York. And um, there's a, a cluster of people between computer and information science, the vet school, uh, animal science and cows that are looking to um, develop machine learning tools to measure uh, changes in tissue of the cows. And that's based on image analysis and video-based deep learning classification so that you can avoid um, some of the problems that come with, um, with in the dairy barn with um, the constant milking of those dairy cows. And there are also mediated versions of uh, hormone um, disseminators that are being built at the nanoscale that can help um, regulate the cow's um, hormone production so that she is bred more easily and uh, the farmers are, are benefiting from not missing a lactation cycle. So there are a number of different types of interventions that are all in an effort to, to try to increase the health of the, of the herd, the health of the crop, the health of the harvest, the health of the of the product that's served to humans, and also to um, enable us, I think, to manage natural resources in a far more effective way and to avoid excesses, be that of um, management of pests or diseases or over fertilization. Um, we also have examples of smart irrigation. And um, I could go on and on about this, but those are some of the kinds of applications that we are developing and applying here. Etsy. That's really, uh, really amazing work and a really a broad range of applications. Um, I'm also interested in, in uh, having our viewers learn more about the, the kind of cloud interconnected aspect of this. Um, I think the, the ability to scale uh, like the software is very interesting. So, um, you know, if you have the, if you have the sensing equipment and the connectivity and the software, you can kind of really scale that pretty far and that you could get a lot of farmers um, access to this type of information that um, I, I guess it's it, it could be a little bit easier in some cases than um, having an extension agent go out to every single farm that needs uh, disease to be diagnosed. Um, but then I, I'm also also imagining uh, the limitations that come with with internet connectivity and, and so on. Um, but if you could just maybe explain a little bit more about how how uh, you're able to bring this data and and move large volumes of data into a, a cloud storage system, and the software is that's analyzing this data is is on a server somewhere in a remote place. And um, it's it's kind of a decentralized, um, well, uh, or it's it's um, it's 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 a it's a it's a network, and and how does that network work? Right, it's a federated system. I think one of the major um, advances, if you will, between where we were technologically fifty years ago and where we are now, is that we don't need to think of things as in, in such a centralized way. There is a centralized concept of the cloud where a lot of data is fed and a lot of uh, analytics are done, but it enables at the same time, um, decentralized use and decentralized access. And so I think that the, the concept of, of uh, digital in the digital ag arena 
is that you no longer need, if you will, the landline, you have the cell phone, you no longer need a, 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 a road, you have uh, either cell phone connectivity or you may have internet connectivity. So that even remote places that are not physically as well connected as they might be, have an opportunity to exchange information and um, data and images and therefore, uh, the power uh, that that data or that information can bring, if they have the appropriate um, interpretation of that data, if they have the analytics that enable them to use data to transform that data into information that can be used to help make better decisions, the decision making is then no longer, it, do, it no longer requires, as you say, an extension agent to walk down a road and physically arrive to talk to the farmer, but the transmission of that information can happen um, across space uh, digitally. But the, but the alternative and the challenge for this is that I think that not everyone has the same degree of internet connectivity or the same degree of digital connectivity. And so one of the challenges as we transition, of course, is to ensure that we have, and sometimes different places are going to have this connectivity in different ways. There's, there are going to be different ways of transmitting digital information across space in time. It doesn't all come through a broadband network, right? It can come through many different types of digital connectivity. So some of the people in computer and information science work on networks and, and utilization of, um, for instance, TV white spaces so that they can harness the power of um, transmitting information even when uh, there isn't even a cell phone tower, there might not be. It might be simply that they're using different ways to, to network that information. This is all part of the, the research arena of many of our colleagues in computer and information science. And one of the things that I've been learning, I mean, it's been real learning for me, is that I used to think of digital ag almost in the same breath as precision ag. I thought of it as a machine. I thought digital ag was sort of like a big tractor that had sensors on it and, 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 and got data about water and fertilizer. And what I've learned over the time I've been working in this wonderful, with this wonderful collective of people is, is how much uh, how decentralized digital ag really, what, what it does to enable decentralized transmission of information. And then it has also raised the, um, you know, the, the red flags around what that might mean. You do not want people to become totally disassociated from each other. You do not want the people who provide information to be completely unknown entities to the person that's going to use that information. You have to establish relationships of trust and relationships of how information is shared and what it means and hopefully investigations about what the implications or the consequences of using these tools will be. And so one of the other things that CETA is doing is investing and, and there's a call for proposals right now uh, across the Cornell campus for people who are interested also in the social implications of using these digital technologies. What is it that, that people are comfortable with and what is it that they might be uncomfortable with? Where does the digital divide create inequity and where does it actually help create greater equity um, and access? And how can we um, understand across our different disciplines the kinds of problems and challenges that we each see as we implement and roll out these, these innovations, if you will, um, whether we're moving towards the goals that we as a society or we as a population have decided are the important goals that we seek to achieve with this technology. I mean, the technology is neither good nor bad, but how it's used and how it's regulated will determine um, whether we actually achieve our goals. And that's why I was saying at the very beginning, we wanna make sure that we not only use it to understand and diagnose, to predict and target intervention, but that we can use it to compare what the outcome is in different situations or before and after so that we have the opportunity to rethink and re-gauge or reinvent if we need to. 
Yeah, and and so I, I wanted to continue that conversation on to thinking about some of the, the social and, and ethical implications of a digital agriculture paradigm. Um, the the issues that immediately stick out are are kind of this the the question that kind of happens with with every technology mm -hmm. is the access question and the the who benefits question. Yeah. Um, you know, is is a technology going to actually increase inequality? Um, when we think of algorithms, are are the ag algorithms? How do you make sure the algorithms are are tuned in a way that's responsive to social needs and and uh, culture? Um, those are those are issues that I that I think of when I think of this. Um, and and so I'm I'm curious what kind of discussions you have within your group about uh, those kinds of issues. I think they're really important issues. We've got um, enough, I think, s awareness of the potential for things to go south, if you will, meaning not well. I, sh I shouldn't use that word, but we, we, we are concerned. And when we say that the vision would be the digital lag enables us to produce safe, plentiful, and healthy food for all, we do have to ask, how that's gonna happen and at what points we need to make sure or get good intel on whether that's going in a way we want. Um, I think that one of the questions is where does the data that we use um, to make our uh, decisions, where does it come from? Is it representative? So for instance, we could start asking now, um, and I think we all have an obligation to start thinking about the questions that need to be asked so that nobody points fingers later. Everyone is invited to ask uh, appropriate questions, but some questions might be, are we getting data on um, women as well as men? Do women own cell phones? And are we able to track whether there is a gender difference in some of the responses we're getting? Um, are we able to uh, determine whether people in certain regions of the world are, are actually benefiting in ways that they themselves would like to, or are they just um, being encouraged to feed into a market that is not the one that, that they believe is really benefiting them? In other words, are they just producing for export or are they also uh, producing to help improve the quality of life for people in their local area? Um, I also see very often the opportunities that sometimes go unused. Um, the cell phone can be used for many, many things, for good and for, I won't say evil, but for, for some very nefarious ends as well. Um, and because the cell phone is so ubiquitous and the cell phone is um, an opportunity, uh, I think that sometimes people don't bother to do what they can do because they want to do that, which is really novel. Um, and, and to that extent, I would say that we have a lot of work to do to just make things work well that already that have already been invented, but make sure that they're working well uh, across the board. And one of the examples I gave earlier about disease forecasting in, in, in the vineyards here in the Northeast, I might just say that that kind of technology is widespread in California, in the big vineyards of California, but it's not as widespread in the smaller vineyards here in upstate New York. And so that's an example. You don't have to go overseas to find examples where existing technology still needs to be optimized and reduced to practice and growers in a local area still need to be introduced to it and they need to transition and they need to find out how it's working for them. So we are working at many scales and at many levels to try to address these um, social concerns. And we certainly um, look forward to having people who can articulate uh, the questions that they feel are appropriate and help us look for solutions as we go. Um, so uh, let's see, I have one. There's one, um, there's one question in the chat here um, from uh, Hebed about um, digital agriculture, uh, social enterprises, 
um, I, I guess, let's see, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question right. Are, um, are social enterprises working with, so, yeah, I guess it's, 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 does, does Cornell see its, its work um, as uh, being something that can impact uh, social enterprises and, and how do you see kind of a, a digital agriculture social enterprise uh, system kind of working? Does... Challenging what is meant by social enterprise maybe for me. Um... Is that in a business sense? Um, uh, the question is kind of unclear. Um, so maybe we can, hopefully we, ad we addressed that already in some of the other things we were talking about. Um, let me but, just, let me, add, let me, uh, oppor you know, opportunity strikes here. I, I'll interpret it as I want. <laughs> yeah, please. You know, because I think that maybe this person is asking about um, social enterprise in the form of, of um, business opportunity maybe, or, uh, socially responsible business opportunity. I will just say that one of the events that CEDA sponsors is a hackathon each year. And the hackathon is designed to bring teams of students, undergrad and graduate students together, not only from across the university, uh, but 50% of our people are coming from universities in other parts of the world. This year we had um, from UC Davis, from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, from Wageningen University in Netherlands and from uh, China Agricultural University. So we had people from different parts of the world that were also part of our hackathon. And we, we create, we help create, I mean, the teams are spontaneously formed, teams of students from different walks of life and different backgrounds who've never met each other um, come together to address some of the challenges in digital ag and come up with solutions in over a 48 hour period. And some of those solutions are in fact seeds for companies. So some of them go forward and become innovation grants through the Cornell um, Young Entrepreneur System. So in fact, several of the winning um, proposals this year, and you can go on uh, into the Chronicle or go online and see what some of them were. They were fantastic opportunities to create an app, for instance, a very doable thing that would help. Uh, one was to track locusts that have um, converged on crops in Africa this year in 2019 in East Africa. It's been a really bad year for locusts. And think about either alerting farmers or diverting locusts in, in, in a number of very innovative ways. There were other um, opportunities that have come forward for, for things that can be done in real time and that solve problems and have business opportunities. So I don't know if that's what the person was asking, but they, we do sponsor these kinds of gatherings so that students can come together, meet people from other walks of life, um, together create ideas and possible solutions and pursue those as they wish. Um, I have another question about uh, ideas of, of public research and, and open access. Um, I know that you, you've spent your entire career as a public researcher. And so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, what do you think about uh, digital agriculture in terms of uh, open access benefits, open access algorithms and um, those kind of putting putting those things into the public trust into the public domain uh, versus uh, a more of a privatized paradigm where uh, this data that's coming out of these farms would be run by by and analyzed by private firms and subscription models and uh, private intellectual property um, I, I see a huge uh, public interest in the benefits that digital agriculture could bring. And then, the, but there's also this tension where a lot of the underlying tech that drives it is, uh, especially the infrastructure is, uh, tele telecommunications infrastructure is privately owned. So there's a tension there. There is a tension, yes. And um, I think the public private tension is, is embedded in the system that that we all live and work in because when you uh, when you use cloud computing you are 
you are entering into a um, pay-as-you-go model. And so you do have to um, understand the, the opportunities and the possibilities, but also the limitations. I will say that a great deal of the software that's developed at Cornell goes into um, the open source domain and the software, therefore, the software solutions can be used or reused. They can be red hatted, they can be, um, you know, they can provide inspiration to others. But there are also private um, companies that are interested in, in continuing to use whatever product development they do to drive investment in future research. And that's the engine of the private sector. So we work with both. Um, there is interest in different kinds of both public and private level investments in digital ag uh, at Cornell. Um, we are, a, I think we are very much open to whatever people want to do. The main thing is while you're at Cornell and during the time that you are in a public university and doing sponsored research, uh, your goal is to share the outcome of what you're learning with others, uh, be you a professor or be you a student. And whether you do that under um, certain guidelines that restrict, for instance, the disclosure of certain details or not, uh, most of your professors here at Cornell, and I think a great number of the students are here to learn and to share what they know. And that's the, that's the whole point of being in a university environment. Once you leave the university, you may find that you're more enclosed in a system that is um, protecting its, its IP. But within the university, I think you're constantly operating across that tension of public-private options. And I will say, just let me mention in my own career, I've stuck with public funding um, because public funding was available to me. I think it's a very challenging thing. There are types of work where the public funding may be restricted. And if you're making innovations and you're really driving new knowledge in an area where private funding is, is the only available type of funding you can get, you have to make a choice between um, accepting that funding to go down that road or uh, doing something else. So funding is a funny thing in a, in a university. You can only get public funding if public funding is available for the things you're trying to do. Yeah, uh, going back to the the gender question, um, one one thing that has has kind of struck me that I've been thinking about is uh, the, we we know that women are underrepresented in STEM fields. Uh, that's that's well known, um, and it, it seems that the the life sciences and biology is doing only is slightly better. It's, it's still underrepresentation, but it's definitely slightly better in the life sciences and biology as opposed to engineering versus and uh, computer science, which is a very uh, male dominated field. So I'm wondering if you see digital agriculture as an entry point where the field of computer science and engineering can become more, uh, more feminized, more inclusive, uh, and that would actually bring more equality into the STEM field in general. Yeah, I mean, these are very um, relevant questions right now. I think a lot of us are endeavoring very hard um, to open the door to groups of people that have not been well represented in the STEM fields. But that's to say that those, obviously people have to want to come into the STEM fields. When I came into um, my, uh, my particular career trajectory, it was unusual to have females in, in the field as well. And so when you're one of those people that forges a new path and you open it up behind you, pretty soon people forget it, it was ever any different. Um, I think there have been remarkable strides, but yes, we are seeing digital agriculture in general, opening doors to people that might not have had the, the same interests before. So I'm not gonna say the door was absolutely closed. I think it's partly how much interest somebody has, but what's quite exciting is that agriculture, as it's practiced in many parts of the world, and I don't mean just in the United States, but agriculture's, the average age of the producer is about 55 years old. In other words, young people have not been coming into the field of agriculture for, for some years. 
And with the advent of digital agriculture and the opening up of tech opportunities and new ways of thinking, it's completely transforming agriculture as a field of interest. We're seeing more interest from people coming from urban areas, maybe because they're more interested in how food is produced and what they eat. They're more concerned about health or they're more concerned about how it's produced. We're also seeing more people come in from underrepresented groups that never found agriculture in any way interesting previously. So part of that may be to open up um, the doors uh, at the gender level, but also I think across the board to seeing people coming in who are, whose interests and whose backgrounds are not inherently aligned with agriculture, but they see agriculture as a realm of opportunity. It's being reinvented and we're, and we're rethinking so many things. And I think a lot of interest in environment, in resource use, in, um, in equity and in health are driving um, people to think of agriculture as part of that larger arena. Agriculture is certainly a player. If we wanna improve uh, natural resource use, um, food quality, human health, agriculture has a huge role to play. Uh, for people who are just joining us, we're listening to, we're, we're talking with Susan McCooch, who's director of the Cornell Institute for Digital Agriculture. And we're talking about digital agriculture for global development. Uh, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat and we'll try to address them as we uh, wrap up the program, um, looking at the chat on, on Facebook and in the uh, Zoom platform. So uh, let us know if you have any questions about uh, digital agriculture that you'd like to ask. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, your, your journey as a, as a, a rice breeder, as a rice geneticist, and, and how did you, um, how did you kind of make the transition from, um, from rice into the digital agriculture space? Was that a natural transition? And was that, was that something that you were um, expecting to make? And what was the, the, the learning point all kind of along the way for you? It's always interesting how people um, seemingly become what they become, right? Um, in my case, just, I don't know who I'm speaking to, who's in the audience, but I did my PhD here at Cornell and uh, developed the first molecular map of rice. And then the opportunity opened up for me to go to Erie in Philippines and, and utilize that map to try to help accelerate or augment the potential for, for breeding um, resistance, resistant forms of rice, resistant to diseases and insects, uh, more nutritious rice and rice that could tolerate various environmental extremes. And I went to Erie and one of the things that uh, I was challenged with when I first got there was the fact that I'd left all of my notebooks all of my early work had, had remained at Cornell. I had no access to the information that I had generated as a graduate student. And I could not bring, there were notebooks and notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of things. So it was all very physical and very uh, bulky at the time. And the one thing, this was before internet, the one thing I wished for was some way that I could just x-ray in and take a look at all those notebooks of things, all that information I had generated that sat in Ithaca and I needed it in Philippines. And as we trained people in India and people in Bangladesh and people in China and people in Japan and people all around the world, we had no way to exchange that information. So I think my transition happened at the earliest stages of my career where I then became interested when the internet opened up, suddenly we had a way to digitize information and exchange it and I, was one of the early adopters. We developed an early database for rice. We were the first, uh, you know, we were in the vanguard of developing those tools because we needed the information. We needed it where we were. Otherwise we had to duplicate all of the effort that it took to, to develop the same information again. So in the early days, I, I was part of the move to digitize genetic information. This was before sequencing was automated. Um, in order to be able to apply the molecular mapping and the genomics tools that we had been developing in the rice breeding programs in Asia where I was working. 
So that's how I, I, I guess, Chris, that's my answer is that's how I became interested in it. And I've always been at the um, kind of at the interface of understanding the value of information in a timely way. Like when you get the information you need and you can make a good decision because you have it and it's not expensive because somebody else generated and shared it in a system that has become something we now take for granted. I think if you lived in a world before all that was possible, you have no question about the value of digital ag. It's just that the kinds of information and the amount of information that we're talking about today is so much vaster and more varied. And therefore the integration of these streams of information and what it can tell you and how it can help you make decisions is far more extensive and it, and it, and it penetrates your life more deeply. Now, I want to just come back to that concept that I mentioned at the very beginning is that the other piece of the digital ag revolution, if you will, is that it helps us understand the living system better. It not only tells us what's happening in the system, but by understanding what's happening in real time, it gives us a much, a much better understanding of the complex systems that we're dealing with and how our interventions and when our interventions can be made so that they disrupt the, the, the total ecosystem in the least possible way. In other words, how can we work with biology and stop trying to control biology? And this is partly what this digital ag revolution means to me. I'm a geneticist and I love the idea that I can learn much more deeply what's happening inside a plant in response to an environmental shift that is happening minute by minute as a cloud comes over or as it rains or if it's if it's drought stricken and how to respond how the plant is responding physiologically and how I can better then um, keep that plant healthy and productive and um, interacting constructively with the microbiome in its root systems and with the plants around it. So I am really excited about it, both as a learning opportunity as well as as a, a management tool. Um, that's that's really great. And then, so you've also talked about this. This is being applied on farms, but also upstream in these right. breeding programs. So, right. um, what do you think are some of the implications for for plant breeding programs um, that are operating right now and kind of just on the cusp of? Uh, really making use of this uh, digital uh, transformation? Well, plant breeding as a field may not be familiar to everybody on the call, but I think that um, it's a good example. Plant breeders have to manage, you know, thousands of offspring from every cross that they make, and they have to try to evaluate them in terms of their performance under a range of different environmental uh, environments, if you will, or environmental variables. And so for a plant breeder, how you select the plants that are going to do well in your target environments, when you have, let's say, 10,000 of them that are genetically different, all derived from a common cross between two parents, how are you going to select the ones that you want to continue to move forward in your breeding program? And how are you going to select the ones that you're going to eliminate that are not going to perform up to par? That is the kind of thing that digital ag is helping us do because we can start to get not only sensors in terms of what is going on in the environment and sensors in terms of what's going on in terms of the physiology of the plant or even in terms of the outcome for its health. Is it getting diseased? Is it resisting disease? Is it resisting water stress? Is it managing um, to grow optimally? Does it does it target most of its energy to uh, the crop production or is it targeting just to stem and leaf tissue, for instance? These questions are things that enable us to make better selections and to take fewer resources on the evaluation of plants that are not going to be kept in our programs. And so this enables us to move our breeding programs forward more quickly. And when it comes to climate change, we are in a race against um, we, we, I won't say time, we are trying to find the biological opportunity and, and we want it encapsulated in a plant that can respond appropriately to the environment that it finds itself in. And that environment is no longer as predictable or as manageable as it once was. So we're looking for plants 
that can respond to both heat and drought and, and even drought and flooding in the same season and can do so without um, completely uh, being overwhelmed by those stresses. We are discovering certain innate capacities in these plants and the digital tools are helping us understand and select those individuals. Uh, well, thank you very much for that, Susan. That it's uh, visionary as always. Um, so then, as we as we wrap up, um, maybe if you could just let our viewers know about um, if there is uh, any interesting uh, uh, new work or 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 things coming up from the uh, students or faculty involved in CETA that we should be aware of. Um, any important events or or publications coming up that we should look forward to and. How do people find out more about the Cornell Institute for Digital Agriculture? So the easiest way is to go to the website. Um, the website is one word, digital agriculture, and then dot cornell dot edu. Um, that website hosts uh, the current call for proposals. If you're interested, there was a call that ended today for graduate student and undergraduate summer stipends. If you've missed that, uh, faculty still have an opportunity to put in um, a proposal for a cross-college collaborative proposal. Um, the deadline for that will be uh, June 1st, and those, uh, that's the Research Innovation Fund. You can look at that application process right now. Um, we have, uh, we participate in a, a, and we have monthly seminars so you can go into the digital ag site and find out how to connect we had one just this monday so we'll have another one um, next month at the same time it's monday at noon and those you can join virtually um, trying to think what else there might be right now but the website also if you want to go into the website and hit uh, who is CETA we have an opportunity for you to join as a member. If you join as a member of CETA, then you receive the uh, bi-weekly newsletter. And that bi-weekly newsletter is full of interesting seminars and other things around campus, as well as uh, opportunities within digital ag. And there are sometimes internships for students um, in both the private and the public sector. So keep your eye out and please join. We'd love to have you as a new member. Uh, well, thank you so much for sharing it. And thank you so much for um, taking the time to speak with us today on the Alliance for Science Live. Um, it was a, yeah, just a very, very eye-opening discussion. And I'm uh, really interested to see how digital tools will shape the way we're breeding and growing uh, new crops and managing the environment or um, showing mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah, the, the, managing the environment, but as you say, working with the environment rather than trying to control it, um, that seems to be the way forward. Um, so thank you very much, Susan. And let me, add, let me add one thing before everybody leaves. If you go to the digitalagriculture.cornell.edu website, go to what is CEDA and look at the three minute video that your host, Chris Knight has uh, helped us make. And we're very proud of that little three minute video and it will give you a pretty good idea of what CETA is. And therefore I can round out by saying, Chris, it's always a pleasure to work with you and thank you for hosting me today. And um, I, I look forward to meeting many of you who are on the call. So thank you. Thanks, Susan. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, that's it. So um, that's it for today's episode. Um, <laughs> follow us on Facebook, Science Ally, Twitter, Science Ally, um, and allianceforscience.cornell.edu. And we'll catch you next time. So thanks again, Susan. Yeah. And I'll talk to you later. Bye, Chris. Bye-bye.